Yes, I. This song is called Be the Change. Inspired by the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who lived for peace and not violence, and told us to be the change we wish to see in the world. Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon. Uh, we are recording this on the same day we're releasing it, which is unusual for us. Uh, uh, April 27th, 2014, and wow, we have a fantastic show lined up for you guys. And uh, I'll tell you what, I got up this morning, Ramon, and knowing that if we had this show scheduled uh and and i don't know i just i just got uh when i thought about it i was like i just got a really good feeling and 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 i don't know it it set my pace for the day and so you know i like i like having uh that uh, i don't know that optimistic and energetic feeling uh in, in anticipation of something that i feel is going to be uh, very fun so it's good stuff. How's it going over there in uh, Japan, Ramon? Uh, pretty good. I had a, you know, it's late night for me here. It's uh, one o'clock in the morning. So my day, I uh, went to the movies, went to watch a Japanese movie. Um, did, did the live show with you. That was my morning. Um, it's yeah. uh, really happy my uh, yuzu tree is starting to bloom. So that's exciting. Well, that's that secret ingredient. Yeah, because actually for the past, um, well, it's almost almost two years. I was like struggling with it. The leaves were falling off. I was like moving it around, and then I found the one little corner in the back area that gets um, uh, maybe like six, seven hours of sun, and plus the secret ingredient. Which um, for those of you who plant, try this because. Um, I, I compared before I started doing this and after, especially with my mints, it made a huge difference, which is, I, I heard this from Santo Bonacci, um, I started adding 20% urine and 80% um, rainwater, and put it like every other day or every two, three days in the plant. Wow, what a difference. The uh, mints are just huge. And for the, those of you who are my Facebook friends, you you can see it, um, those mints. And, and, you know, of course, people get like a little, when I tell them that, they, they look at me kind of weird. And it's like, what's so weird about that? I mean, they put manure in the food you eat, <laughs> in the uh, plants to grow them. So. Yeah, that's a... Uh... You know they. You know they say that uh, uh, human feces is probably one of the the best fertilizers out there. Really? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean, instead of you know using cow manure or chicken manure, uh, use human manure. I know <laughs> the the Inca have <laughs> that thing that the Spaniards call te, terra petra, which was pretty much a mixture of like uh, compost and human manure. And they would like um, chart it, and you know that supposedly is the best in the world because two thousand years later, it's still like for fer very fertile ground. Yeah, you know, there's there's something that just crossed my mind about that, Ramon. You know how, uh, uh, you know, we've done a bit of research into growing and seeds and and how to uh, uh, kind of pre-program your your garden to uh, give the best and, and most fruitful nutrients to you that, that your body needs. Uh, things like putting the seed in your mouth before you, before you, water, before you plant them yeah. and, uh, you know, putting something of yourself into it, uh, uh, kind of pre-programming the seed. So I'm, I'm, I just, uh, and this just popped into my head that I wonder 
in doing at least even what you're doing with the urine uh if that's going to actually uh, help pre-program the the plants to give you what you need the most out of what the nutrients that they have to give you know what that only makes sense i never thought about it that way um but that only makes sense why you would put the saliva or the urine because exactly, it, exactly. It, it, it's a it's a cycle of life so um, it only makes sense if it did that interesting stuff interesting yeah, stuff it's, you know it's I, a i'm going to observation i'm going to have to uh, you know we just you just told me about this here a couple of days ago i i think i'm going to have to start uh, start collecting and use it in my garden out there and uh, which is which is really starting to move along now. I've, all my peas are starting to break ground, and and uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited about my garden this year. I'm actually, I think next week I'm going to be able to start pulling lettuce already. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's moving right along. We did get quite a bit of rain, and my my tomatoes kind of suffered for it, but uh, it looks like they st- they survived the the downpours that we had here in the last couple of weeks so. speaking of downpours i think our guest is quite an expert in being caught in downpours <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably probably so probably oh, so so let's go ahead and get going we've got a special treat for you guys today we've got lee elders and lee was destined to be an investigator slash invet- adventurer He's born in a railroad house in Boyle, Arizona, and raised on the Apache Reservation near San Carlos, where he, where his pet was a coyote and his mentor an Apache medicine man who helped forge his resolve during his expeditions in Ecuador. Lee has an extensive background in investigations, including Intercept, his company that specializes in computer security and electronic countermeasures. An author and documentary filmmaker, Lee and his wife, Britt, have traveled the world exploring the unknown. And we're going to kind of center center this uh, interview today around his uh, new book, uh, Expeditions, which uh, some fantastic work there. And what a story. Oh, my God, this guy has gone to to some places that uh, I can only dream of, of making to in my lifetime. So... Uh, uh, well, actually, even to places that, uh, like, I grew up with a lot of Ecuadorians, even Ecuadorians that haven't been to those places. So, <laughs> exactly. Welcome to the Hundreds Monkey Radio, Lee Elders. Hey, thank you, guys. Pleasure being here. So, uh, we 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 mentioned in the bio there uh, that you were raised on the Apache Reservation, uh, and. You know, that in itself has to have a, a tremendous amount of tales to, to go with it. Uh, what was that like growing up on a reservation? Oh, boy, that was, well, at the time, it was fantastic. I loved it, even though uh, I was the only, uh, shall we say, blonde-haired uh, young boy out there. And uh, a lot of rock fights between the young Apache kids and myself. And I was always the loser. But hmm. uh, anyway, uh, after we solved those differences, uh, yeah, I grew up there. And uh, I got my first taste of, uh, shall we say, adventure there. Some people might call it an addiction. I, 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 I prefer the word fascination. But I used to explore the, oh, the dry washes and the hills around our railroad house we lived out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, I really loved it. And uh, uh, one day, my uh, grandfather, my, my grandparents raised me. My grandfather was a section foreman on the Southern Pacific Railroad, and that's why we lived where we lived. But one day, he uh, found a uh, young little coyote pup by the side of the railroad track, so he brought him home. Apparently, he was lost from his pack, very young. And I thought, wow, I've got a dog to play with. <laughs> and so I raised him, and uh, <clears throat> we had a great time together. But back in those days, and this is in the oh, mid-40s, the Apaches were clearly third-world citizens back in those days. They lived in teepees. They lived in hogans around their house. And we weren't much better off than them, except we had a wooden frame railroad house. We had no electricity in it and no uh, bathroom in it. 
we had to, uh, my grandfather built a, a bathroom out of the coal shore, uh, storage shed, and that's where we'd take our showers and so forth. And we used lamps for electricity. And I remember when they first installed the first telephone there, uh, every time you had a lightning storm, uh, we'd, ha we'd have to get off the phone. Oh, right. <laughs> it might be a ball of energy come through it, you know. But And also it was a party line. <clears throat> but those days were great. You know, they're gone forever today, but uh, they were wonderful. I, I, I really uh, enjoyed them. So coyotes, they're the from what I understand, they're they're not no, not necessarily the easiest animal to domesticate, and uh, when a coyote attaches themselves to a human, there's there's normally some significance uh, as far as you know the uh, the animal spirit guide uh, realms that come into play there. Uh, did you? I mean, I know you you did have the medicine man uh, who, uh, as a mentor, uh, was there anything, uh, did you ever learn anything about w why the coyote uh, attached itself to you? Well, uh, the medicine man, he called himself the Apache Kid, and uh, I, I asked him several times, uh, you've got to remember I was like nine, ten years of age back then, but... Uh, I asked him if he was the real Apache kid, right? which there was a, quite a legend about him, and he just laughed and smiled. So I really never knew if he was a real desperado they call the uh, Apache kid or if he was just using that name. But he did tell me about coyotes. He told me that uh, he had a coyote uh, uh, <clears throat> friend at one time, and he said they were spirit dogs. And he said they would find their way to the right spirit. And then he talked about the coyote clan, uh, one of the Apache clans. He says a lot of the a lot of the Apaches felt that the coyote was a prankster. Right. And but then others in the Apache tribe said, No, no, they're spirit dogs. So I came to know him as my spirit dog. And what brought him to me, I can't say, but we grew up together, we appreciated each other, and we stayed together until one weekend, I had to go spend some time with my mother who was living in another city, and I was gone like three days. When I came back, my grandfather said uh, that uh, Lobo had left, that was the name of the coyote, I, I'd given him that name. I said, where did he go? And he says, I don't know, but he howled for uh, one night. And the next day, he just took off. I never saw him again. But I had him in my life for a couple of years. And it was very important to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt, as a youngster, I really felt bad about that because I felt that that Lobo felt that maybe I had abandoned him mm. because I'd never been away from him until that period of time. Right, right. Or maybe he just joined his pack or he was old enough now to go out and establish his own pack, maybe. Right. Yeah. Um, the name you gave him, did you give it to him on purpose? Just for those of you who don't speak Spanish, Lobo means wolf in, in Spanish. Uh, gosh, I don't remember at this point in time. I probably, uh, maybe I had seen something like that in a comic book or had heard about Lobo meaning wolf. But to me, he was a Lobo because uh, of the reputation and the fact when I first started raising him, I mean, he was real snarly, you know. But of course, he come to appreciate the food that he got every day and the water, and the fact that he could sleep uh, on the floor next to me. He had warmth, he had uh, security, and I think that helped de develop him into more of a, do a domesticated animal than perhaps uh, an animal from the wild. Right. Mm. So, so, go ahead, Ramon. Well, I was going to say, um, 
why why was it that the um apache kids were le- left you alone after like beating you up for oh. so long <clears throat> yeah the, well after lobo came into my life they sort of steered away from me and the old mentor i had the apache uh, uh kid he told me he said that uh the apache boys will leave you alone now because that's your spirit dog and uh they fear him and they don't want to disturb that relationship and by that time uh the boys had adjusted to me as well because i shared toys with them and uh you know christmas and holidays they didn't have much and i tried to give them what i could and become friends with them and i accepted them for what they were and eventually they accepted me uh, as an outsider into their world and i think i think the spirit dog had a lot to do with that any any uh indian blood in you at all no no but my wife is uh brit is uh cherokee and choctaw and danish hmm. and, wow hmm. interesting mix oh yeah she's an interesting woman that has to be to be with you for so long (laughs) thank you (laughs) oh oh, she's beautiful too by the way absolutely beautiful yes so she knew how to how to tame you oh she did a good job on that (laughs) (laughs) I, i was a little bit scurly myself when we met and our meeting was something else because i met her uh, I was coming back from Ecuador, and uh, I hadn't had a chance to shower or do anything, and I, I just jumped on a plane. I had been living with the Shawara, and they had given me some gifts. And with the Shawaras, when they give you a gift, you have to, you know, give them one as well. But anyway, my gift was a, I had two Bodacaros, which are blowguns. And I had a monkey pouch that one of the uh, shawar had made for me. And in the monkey pouch were the darts that went into the blowgun. And they were uh, dipped in karari, poison. Wow. <laughs> that was her gift to me. And I had a, I had a lance, uh, one of their spears, which is made out of wyacan uh, wood, one of the hardest woods in the Amazon jungle. So here I am coming through LAX, and <laughs> all of a sudden uh, I'm walking down this aisle where all the people in suits and fine dresses, and I hadn't seen a, I hadn't seen a woman in about six months, a beautiful woman, I'll put it that way. And it was like Moses parting the Red Sea. I mean, these people wanted nothing to do with me, and I can't blame them. My hair was down to my shoulder, and I'm carrying... <laughs> I'm carrying the trappings of war. <clears throat> so they parted their ways, and I was starved. And I went up and got in line to get some food. And I was standing there, and I noticed this beautiful platinum blonde girl standing about, oh, 10 or 20 feet in front of me, waiting in line. <clears throat> it was Brit. At the time, I didn't know her. But there was two rambunctious dudes behind her giving her a hard time. So I moved up in line, I got behind these two guys, and I tapped one of them on the, in the back of the leg with my Wyacon lance, and he turned around to maybe do battle with me, I don't know, but took one look at me and decided that discretion's a better part of valor. <laughs> so they left quickly, and so then I tried to carry on a conversation with Britt. She turned around gave me the dirtiest look in the world. And then the waitress came up and said, well, we have one table left with two seats. Are you a couple? And I said, yes. She glared at me, but anyway, she was hungry too. So we wound up at the same table together. And she was eyeing me, let's say, very suspiciously. And I must have looked like I'd just come out out of a Tarzan movie or something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, it was still a conversation in the beginning, but eventually... We started communicating after she found out I wasn't uh, uh, some crazy hippie or I wasn't uh, an extra in some Tarzan movie. Mm. And, I, and I told her I'd just come out of the 
out of Ecuador and I'd been uh, living in Chihuahua country and of course that caught her ear because being uh, half Cherokee Choctaw <clears throat> she wanted to know more about the Chihuahua so that started our conversation wow. and through that we became friends and later we, we got married Wow, great story great story, it's amazing how uh, how the uh, universe brings people together uh, it's just amazing yeah. yeah. Does does this seem does this seem like uh, sometimes in your life it, things were put there so you can do that? Like growing up on the Apache thing was a training ground for your life with the Chihuahua, and then <clears throat> having that experience meeting then your wife, and then later on to the other things you you did. Did it always seem like um for you like almost like a predestiny kind of thing? Oh, definitely. Uh, I did an interview on a radio show about three, four weeks ago, and the woman, uh, I won't mention any names, but the woman kept saying, gosh, Lee, you're so blessed, you're so blessed. Well, in a way, I guess I was. At the time, I really didn't realize it until I got much older and started thinking about things like that. But yes, I, I have to say that destiny has played such an important role in my life. And the other thing I attribute to uh, my success and my well-being is synchronicity. The synchronicity of things that occurred in my life back in those days and even later on when I was involved in my UFO research and investigations, it, it reared its head again. So to answer your question, yes, I do believe that. Hmm. Hmm. So what was it that sparked your interest about Ecuador, and how did you uh, end up down there? Well, <laughs> that was interesting. I was, uh, I was working in mortgage banking. I was a commercial loan officer, and uh, I was bored out of my mind. I'd been with this company for a couple of years, and I was sort of looking for something that I could go back to my childhood, some form of adventure in my life. And a friend of mine came by one day and he said, Lee, he says, there's a Arizona mining company that's going to Ecuador and they're going to do some gold mining down there, alluvial gold mining. And he says, they're looking for a couple underwater divers. And he says, uh, if you're interested, I'll put you in touch with them. So I said, great. So he did. And they hired me on the spot, even though I had no experience in underwater diving. <laughs> but uh, they weren't getting too many takers, you know, for the job opening they had. So I felt secure, and I felt, I, you know, I could learn on the OJT, on the job training. So that's how it began. Uh, they flew us down there, the, the workers and the people involved with the dredging operation. And then they sent all of their equipment, and they had a huge manifest they had a large mac truck they had the old uh i don't know if you're familiar with the old world war ii duck they called it right it's an amphibious vehic vehicle uh, that's what the platform was for their uh, uh suction hoses and dredges anyway they sent that down by ship and we all met in Guayaquil. And uh, the ship came in with all their equipment. Everybody's ready to go. We're excited. And Ecuadorian Customs all of a sudden hits them with a $50,000 special tax for their equipment. <coughs> Excuse surprise, me. surprise. Yeah, it was called Mordita. Right. <laughs> right. If you know what Mordita is. Grease the palms. Yeah. There you go. So... The mining company says, hey, we're not going to be uh, blackmailed and we're not going to do this. So they turned around and went home. Well, I stayed. And here I am. I've never been there before. My Spanish is limited. Uh, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? But God, what a fascinating place Ecuador was. I mean, it was literally the Wild West back then. And it was sort of like Peridot, where I grew up. Apache Reservation. It, it was just wonderful. So I decided to strike out on my own, and that's what started my adventures in Ecuador. Hmm. 
Yeah. Do you find do you find that when you um went down there were the people um very were were they attracted to you right away or something that had to be built little by little? Oh, uh, in the cities I was okay. There were three major cities then. There was Quito, Guayaquil and Cuenca. And I went to Cuenca which is up in the highlands in the Andes. It's about 8,000 feet elevation, but it's the gateway to the Oriente. And the Oriente means, in Spanish, means east, but it was the uh, gateway into the Amazon basin. And if you wanted to explore in the Amazon area, you had to literally go through Cuenca. So I put my base of operations there, met some wonderful people, and they accepted me, but when I went out into the mountains, I went out to look for this uh, <clears throat> river the mining company was going to uh, exploit. And in that area, I had to work with uh, a group of Indians, which were known as Canaries. <clears throat> and the Canary Indians, uh, they didn't take to me real kindly. Uh, they didn't trust outsiders. But eventually, uh, in working with them and sampling some of the rivers in that area, they came to know me, and they felt that I was trustworthy. And then they told me the secret about this river that the village had, which was a three-day walk, I might add. It was, the name of the river was Little Hell. And they said that it was plentiful in gold, and they would be willing to take me there, providing I would share with them or share with the village. So I said, of course I will. <clears throat> so that started my my first expedition, which I might add was very successful. The Indians were telling the truth. We panned out two coffee cans full of gold the first day we were there. And then a storm came up, and we were cut off from... Uh, getting out back to civilization, we had built our campsite on high ground, and the river had rose uh, so much during the night we couldn't cross it. So we spent about four or five days there trying to figure out how to get across, and eventually we did. Uh, but uh, uh, when I got back to civilization, I decided to go back, and this time go back with the dredge, and I called a friend out of Yuma, Arizona to join me, and he flew down. He was a construction guy. He knew how to build dredges. He had built a lot of homes in the Yuma area. So we set out to go back to Little Hell because it was very prolific. And the Indians by that time had accepted me. And I had sold the two coffee cans full of nuggets in Waiakil. And I would sent the the village a telegram telling them that that everything was going according to plan I'd be there soon with their share and which I did and they were paid and the, the guys that worked with me were paid so everybody was happy because now they knew I was trustworthy and so here I am on my way back to the second my second expedition <coughs> Excuse my coughing, but I live on, up here in the mountains of northern Arizona, and uh, the allergies are out real bad. Oh, so. yeah. This time of the year. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, I, we made an attempt to get back, and uh, we were unsuccessful, and I came back to the States after that point in time. So and, why were you unsuccessful there? Of getting back out. I mean, that sounds like a, a gold mine, literally. I mean, well, it it was. Uh, I had uh, met this young man who was acting as my translator before we went back on our second trip. His name was Adriano Ventimiglia, and he was a college student, and he worked for the Department of Justice in Cuenca, and he he liked me and became my friend. He says, Lee, we've got to do a background check on anybody you hire. Well, when we went back the second trip, I had to hire, I think it was like 60 to 70 cargo carriers because the trip was so 
long. It was three days, three days of walking. You couldn't take horses in. So all of our jerry cans of gas, dredge parts, food, tents, all of that had to be packed in. And so I had to hire a lot of uh, workers. And he did a double check on the names, and everybody was fine except three of them. <coughs> Excuse me. And these three, one was a horse thief. And I said, well, that's okay out here. My gosh, you know. And he said, no, once a thief, always a thief. <laughs> that was his uh, philosophy. He says, we've got to let him go. But the other two, he says, are murderers, and we don't want them with you. So he went out with me that morning when we hired everybody. These three guys had shown up. Of course, they'd been hired. But uh, <clears throat> Adriano fired him on the spot. He says, no, you're not going. Well, of course, that built up a lot of resentment. He almost had a fist fight with one of them. And uh, eventually they left, or I thought they had left. But one of them had uh, literally penetrated our workforce, and uh, he sought revenge. He got it. On the second day, <coughs> excuse me, on the second day, we were camped by a, a, a lagoon. And this lagoon was uh, near an extinct volcano. And the water in that area was full of sulfur. So sometime during the night, he had emptied our canteen, canteens and our water supply and filled it with this sulfuric water. And, of course, the next day, everybody came down real ill, except myself and a couple other guys, <clears throat> and uh, found out who did it and threatened him, told him not to move, stay in place, and he was, would be watched. But that didn't help uh, my friend Bob from Yuma. He was deathly ill and a lot of the workers. So uh, one of the Indians with me, uh, I selected an Indian young man to go with me. And we had to climb out of the canyon in a horrific thunderstorm, make our way up the side of the canyon through mud, torrential rain, finally got to the top of the canyon. And uh, this is at night. By this time, our uh, flashlights are dead, batteries are gone, and so we have to rely literally on the moon to figure out how to get back to the village of Nabon. And it make a long story short, it took about uh, 12, 14 hours, I think, if memory served, serves me correct. Finally got back there. I got horses to get to the ridge, and... We pulled our men out one by one. Uh, but this betrayal had killed our second expedition. Wow. Yeah. And that, uh, I, that, I, I was, go ahead. I was just going to say that was the end of that expedition. And Bob was very ill. So I came back with Bob to the States. And, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's any, the one thing that bothers me, even today, I would say my Achilles heel is betrayal. Uh, betrayal is a horrible instrument, especially if it's done with intent to harm or hurt someone. And here I was trying to help the village pull them out of poverty. I was trying to help the people I was working with, the Kunyaris. And this one man sabotaged everything. And so I came back to the States. I was very bitter. And I was trying to understand what was going on there. And I, oh, a couple months went by. And then I received a letter from Adriano Bentamia, my translator and good friend, telling me about this Emerald Project. Before we uh, move on, Leah, I, I want to go back to the betrayal uh, before getting too far off. Um, the, the, the What bothers me the most about that betrayal is it's not so much that, because I can somewhat understand his mentality and why he would do that. Not saying that it's correct, but I can somewhat understand. What I don't understand is that there were people who knew that there, and there were people who actually had, many people had left the expedition because he was threatening them. 
So you have one guy and around 65 to 70 people, and they couldn't stop him knowing that he was taking food out off their table, literally. Uh, yes, uh, he did have control over, uh, I'd say, most of these people. Of course, my hand-picked crew that I'd worked with in the past, when I went, first went in there, they were with me. Uh, I don't think they knew what was going on. Uh, it was only amongst the cargo carriers that we had hired. And uh, I don't understand why someone didn't report it. I, I don't know what he held over them. But they didn't, and it wasn't until everybody started coming down sick that we found out we had a problem. And eventually, I found this young boy, one of the cargo carriers, and I singled him out. And I said, did you do this? And uh, lucky, you know, it was luckily because Adriano had given me his thirty-eight pistol. I was doing all this stuff, and I was unarmed. But after he had fired these men, he said, look, take my 38, you might need it. And I don't know why he did that, but it, it turned out it was very good that I did that because they knew I had a weapon. And the young boy I approached, he was scared to death, and he became the informant. And he told me about this man who was sitting over on his backpack, that he was the one that did it. <clears throat> so when I confronted this... Uh, this person, of course, he denied it. He said the young boy didn't know what he was talking about. He was wrong. And he pleaded with me that it wasn't him. But I had the gut feeling it was because uh, just his energy, the way he responded to my questions and things like that. But to answer your question, I don't know why it wasn't reported before the damage was, you know, was literally done. Yeah, because it, the you know to to look at a bigger scope on on that whole thing, that's what I find one of the issues with the whole human species. It's because it's not that many people who are causing the problem. It's only a few. Like for example, that expedition is a perfect example. It's only that one man who ruined it for everybody, but nobody bothered to stop him. And I find this playing throughout history over and over and over that this one person or these few people can can hold such a grip over people yeah it's that nice. old that old, old uh saying one bad apple spoils the whole bunch mm -hmm. and and this is very true it, it seems to happen a lot and you know uh i've read stories about uh, maybe somebody being beat up on a, on a street of a major city and people walking by this poor person not offering help or anything else. And when the people were interviewed, the main thing they said is they didn't want to get involved, you know? And I don't know what it is about the fear of involvement, especially when you're trying to undo, undo something that is very wrong. Yeah, especially in a situation like that where they know they know for a fact there's gold there because of the legend they they know that you're good because you came back which we didn't talk about you came back with scarves and you paid all the, your men equally there was nobody above nobody and you even gave some to the town that's you know when i was reading the book i i I kept bumping my head with that. It was, uh, I don't, I couldn't understand why other people would allow that, that, you know, take that, let one person take that away from them. Because yeah. it's rare to have a man like you who's going to go down there, pay people what they're worth, and not, you know, cheat them out of their money or exploit them. I know. I, it was very strange. You know, and another thing we can connect to the beginning of the expedition was the, the Catholic priest in the village. He was really on my side and Adriano's side, and he held special masses, and he had a big pep rally before we left for the second trip into hell. And there was hundreds of people there. Of course, 
a lot of the people were there hoping that I would select them, you know, hire them for the journey, but I could only hire so many. But still, he was uh, telling the, the masses there that uh, to work with me, and this is a great opportunity for everybody here. So let's please work together. And yet this one character, this one guy, uh, he didn't see it that way. He wanted revenge. He got it. And in doing that, he damaged uh, the expedition. He dashed the hopes of the village people, people working with me. And that was it. Mm. But I guess you can just say, well, human nature comes in all forms. I don't know. Yeah, that is a sad testament to human nature right there. Yeah. What did the father say? When, and then we'll move on after that. But what did the father say when you got back? What was... Uh, the father... I don't understand the question. Uh, the priest. When, oh, when, when, when we came back to Nabon? Yeah, yes. after well, all it, this had happened. I never saw him again after that day in the village square. Because oh. I, when I got out of the, when we got out of the mountains, it was late at night, and I had sent a telegram to Adriano to send a car, because we were in bad shape, and he he got there early in the morning, and that's when we left. So I never had a chance to speak to the priest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're back in the states, and Adriano sends you a, a telegram. Well, he sent me a letter, and I still have the letter today. It was he started the letter letter by saying, "This is the most important letter you'll ever read," and of course that got my attention real quick. And then he told me about a man that uh, lived in one of their family's homes, rent free, that he was uh, really liked. He was a explorer. And he had been exploring over in the uh, Oriente region, had run into a woman with two children that were looking for a lost emerald mine that belonged to their family. And uh, he said, Lee, you've got to come down here. I've, I've got additional proof that these emeralds do exist. And uh, <clears throat> I would like you to come down. And if we are successful and God is on our side, then this could be one of the most important discoveries and totally change the political structure and economic structure of my country. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> that was it. I went back to Cuenca uh, within a couple of months. And uh, that began the search for the Lost Mejia Mine. And the way that turned out was the woman with the two children, relatives of uh, Rafael Mejia, the man that found the mine, they were near starvation. They were in the jungle. She was there with two children. Uh, a horrible place to be for someone like that. And no food, no money. And she had this book with her. And... Uh, she met this man, this friend of Adrano's, and said, look, uh, I can't do this anymore, and I'll sell you the book for 300 sucres if you'll promise me that if you find anything that you'll share with us. So the man agreed, gave her the money, never saw her again, brought the book in uh, to Adrano, since he was living in Adrano's father's house, Obviously, uh, the Ventimillas would be the first one he'd share this story with. And uh, Adriano had read the book. And the book basically was this. It wasn't a book about his adventures and finding the mine or anything like that. It was his last will and testament. There was only two pages. In order to preserve the last will and testament, uh, they had the, the family had had the uh, uh, book or had the testament encased in a hardback type of setting looking like a book. So the first two pages was his, his uh, uh, last will and testament. The next eight pages in this hardbound book to preserve these letters and everything 
was uh, his letters to his family, giving them directions on how to share his wealth and who to contribute it to and so forth. And then the next 70, 80 pages were simply historical writings about rubber gathering, bridge building, and this sort of thing in the Oriente. So they were totally irrelevant to how to find the mine. Mm. <clears throat> so we only spent like uh, uh, the time that we had on like eight or nine pages in this hardbound uh, in-case book. And the first two pages was his last will and testament. So the first thing we had to do, our first challenge, was breaking down his riddle. Now, Rafael Bolanos Mejia, <clears throat> as he explained, he worked as a cascaria in the uh, uh, forest, the uh, Marcus. What's a cascaria? Okay, a cascaria it was the name of the workers who harvested quinine out of the cascaria tree. So they were called cascarias. Hmm. And they lived and worked in the jungle primarily harvesting quinine and they would ship it back to Quito and from Quito it went by sailing vessel into Europe so this was primarily what they were doing hmm. he started out as a stacker and then he graduated up as a cutter and eventually he became a hunter for the crew and there was uh, he never mentioned how many men were in there but apparently there was a good sized number because they were constantly looking for food uh, to uh, feed the workers and so forth above and beyond their normal rations. And uh, so one day, according to his story, he was tracking a bear. And <clears throat> the bear was on a ridge and he had an old shotgun, a uh, twin barrel shotgun. And he finally cornered the bear and shot it with both barrels. And the bear killed the bear. The bear started tumbling after it was shot down this ridge, down the side of this uh, small hill. And when it started tumbling, it started tearing loose vegetation, rocks, things of this nature. And finally, <coughs> excuse me, finally, when he started dressing out the carcass of the bear to take the meat back to the camp, he noticed that there was one large rock there that was white. He, he said it was a large white rock with green in it. And he estimated the rock to be about tres arrobas. In Spanish, tres arrobas meant 75 pounds. <clears throat> so he noticed this green stone inside this white matrix and he thought to himself gosh if, if this is tourmaline <clears throat> I've made more today more money today in this fine than I will in working three years out here <clears throat> but if it's emerald and then he, he thought to himself I'm gonna be a very wealthy man so he started chopping the green stones out of the white matrix using his uh, machete and eventually he dulled his machete and he used the stock of his shotgun to break loose uh, specimens of the green stones. Eventually he had three stones. One was about an inch in the size of pure green, and the other two were smaller. So he took these, put them in his pocket, and then he thought, well, I've got to hide this, this big stone so that I can protect it because I found it I want to keep it so he took off his coat wrapped it around the stone he started dragging it towards this river and uh, he called the river the Rio Santa Rosa he couldn't drag it too far but he saw a large rock that was open in the middle as he, as he said in his last testament, will and testament. So he put the stone within the large rock, and then he hid it with other stones. So now he made his way back to camp, 
<clears throat> and uh, with the bear meat and uh, the green stones. <coughs> Excuse me. And he contacted Barana, who was the uh, foreman. He told him about he had found this green stone and would he send it to Quito, which was well, some distance away. And with the next delivery of quinine to have it analyzed to see what kind of stone it was. So Brana said, yes, he would take care of it. So in the meantime, Mejia went back to work, working as the Cascaria and a hunter. And he knew that the analysis would probably take months because they would have to ship it with the quinine in a special pouch and it was destined for a laboratory in Paris, France, called the Simpris Molina Labs. And that's where the, the emerald or the green stone was analyzed. <clears throat> well, in the meantime, while he's waiting for the analysis to get back to him, to find out if he's got tourmaline, does he have green just quartz, or does he have emerald? He doesn't know. But in the meantime, he's conscripted into the Ecuadorian army. Now, Mejia was from Colombia, but they were conscripting everyone to fight in the revolution that was taking place. And this big battle that took place, it was called the Battle of Guayaquil. And Mejia fought there for under the side of General Selassie. <clears throat> now, the other general fighting against Selassie was General Ventimilla. And lo and behold, General Ventimilla was a distant relative of my friend, Adriano Ventimilla, who had sent me all this information about the emeralds. Hmm. But anyway, the battle raged. Mejia was injured very badly. He lost his leg in an artillery duel. After the war was over, after that battle, General Selassie was defeated. And, of course, everyone on the losing side uh, were outcasts at that point. They were either arrested, but if they were foreigners like Mejia was from Colombia, then they were exiled back to Colombia because they were on the losing side. <clears throat> so in the meantime, Mejia is exiled back to Colombia, but he still has friends in Ecuador and they report to him that the analysis had come back to Quito on the green stone, and it was high-quality emerald. Wow. And so now, Mejia's got a real problem. How do I get back to it? Hmm. And it's a serious problem with a man with one leg to go back into the jungle uh, to fight, try to find this rock open in the middle where he hid the stones and try to be successful in doing it. But in the meantime, the word had spread like wildfire after the analysis had come in to the uh, Quinca Mining, uh, yeah, the Quinca Harvesting Company that this was high-grade emerald. Well, Baranya, the man that had delivered the emerald on on behalf of Mejia, <clears throat> he sold that emerald for 300 gold pesos, which was a king's ransom back in those days. So Mejia got, never got any proceeds from the sale. And the sale had gone to a British uh, diplomat who lived in Quito. I believe uh, his name was Hamilton. And Hamilton bought the stone, and another British diplomat got involved, and he bought the other two stones for a lesser price. <clears throat> but now their greed starts to take hold, and they want to know where the emeralds are. And so they take a trip up to Colombia to confront Mejia to tell them where he found the emeralds. <clears throat> and they were so demanding, and Mejia was so frightened that he had to call workers. He was working at that time in Colombia. He had to call some workers in to help protect him. <clears throat> so now he knows that he's got enemies. He's got people that want to know where the emeralds are. <clears throat> but 
but he's getting older. He knows that he has to fill out a last will and testament because under law, uh, Mejia claimed the emeralds as his property. But when you fill out a last will and testament, you have to give this property. You have to describe it. And you have to give directions on where it is located. So he knew that he had uh, enemies. He also knew that uh, there might be outsiders that might have access to this public record, his last will and testament. And it was filed in Tucan, Colombia in uh, 1887. He found the emeralds in 1881. So in his last will and testament, he built in a riddle, uh, a riddle as to where the emeralds were located. And this is, was our first challenge in trying to figure out what this riddle meant. Hmm. So he never got any of the proceeds from the three emeralds that he did pull out? Never got a dime out of them. Wow. Wow. Wow, what a shame. What a shame. And so uh, how much longer after 89, uh, how, lo how much longer did he live after that? Uh, the exact date escapes me, uh, but in 1987... One of my last trips to Ecuador, Britt and I went there. We were fortunate enough to meet his great-grandson, whose name was Segundo Mejia. And he told us, uh, I don't remember the date, I didn't put it in the book, uh, I don't believe, but I think it was in the early 1900s is when he passed away. Hmm. Hmm. I think he said something like 1907 or 06. Oh, it could have been, yes. Yeah, yeah. when he passed. Yeah. yeah. So we reached the uh, top of the hour, and this will be a good chance to give Dee Stro a break. Oh, uh, this is fast, fascinating story, Lee. Fascinating story. Yeah, and we're not done yet. He's oh. he's just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for listening to this first hour, and uh, if you're listening on one of those other media outlets, such as iTunes or YouTube or uh, Vimo or wherever this happens to end up, uh, I would urge you to pop on over to the hundredth monkey radio dot com and uh, to check out the second hour. And if you're not a member yet, I would ask also urge you to become a member and help support the hundredth monkey radio and all that Ramon and I are doing and are continuing to do in uh, sharing stories and uh, helping to raise the consciousness of the planet. Uh, Lee Elder's uh, website is uh, www.leeelders.com, and from there you can uh, have access to uh, this uh, amazing book, which I also strongly urge you guys to take a look at, and uh, you can get links to all his other works out there too, so um, we will... Yeah. And those of you who uh, become members today, Lee will send you a big piece of emerald. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will not send you an emerald. Yes, just sir. kidding. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, we'll see you in the second hour. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. The love you deny is the pain you carry. Namaste. It's to be the change we wish to see in the world. Freedom's calling, I feel the fire that's deep inside us Everybody wants change, but tell me who will guide us To the leaders that pass away, put up your lighters It's a beautiful struggle, but it cannot divide us We're the ones that we've always been waiting for See yourself in the mirror and open up the door Walk through it and feel the love to watch your pores Be the light, life's purpose is to feel joy Metaphysical, lyrical, standing up for truth The only one to make change is walking in your shoes Be the example, don't complain about the news Making music and serving the world with the loo Now you can be the same, or you can be the truth Change, find strength from inside, break through the chains. No one to blame, nothing to prove. You create your reality, it's up to you. Be the change that you wanna see in the world. I got me live for peace. Aspire to peace. So I'm on the fights for the beliefs. Like Martin Luther King. Aspire to be that love, that light. Like Christ, it's light for the moment of need. And if you believe in Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, Christian, it's love to me. My soul here 
search for peace in a world that's flooded with war. History's littered with body scar, trying to settle the score to maintain an archaic platform of power and greed. People fight for land out of survival and need. So I'm killing my television and I'm planting a seed to fill my head with knowledge that I'm seeing receive. Due to the media propaganda, killing my creed. Or what don't kill me make me stronger, feeling straight when I bleed. Fight for interest and forward to attach the feet. They try to sell you anything in this world, nothing for free. Land, air, fire, and water, they keep up in the ante while the anti proletariat hold the powers to be. But we keep fighting, surviving, and thriving, recycling and rhyming. We constantly inclining, we see through the lying and blind. They tactically keep trying to keep you from asking the why. Change that you wanna see in the world, like I need live for peace. A smile of peace. Someone who fights for the beliefs, like more and more. Possibilities creating organizations like aspire to be inspiring young minds to see Building life skills, nurturing creativity, fulfilling the youth's basic needs, listening actively, teaching the tools to succeed. Positive role models we plant to see. The roots drink the water.